I have a very hard job to do, which is to turn you into UN diplomats in two days. What I have done for 20 years, I'm going to do in two days so that you become exactly a UN diplomat by the time you leave tomorrow evening. So I hope you are ready for that. How many of you have already participated in a model UN before? Only one? Nobody else? Okay. Where, where did you have the model UN? Sorry, in Bahrain? Oh, I see. Not in Kerala. All right. But there are many United Nations model UN uh, taking place all the time. In fact, I've been invited to about three of them in this month itself. And I'm surprised that uh, any of you did not have a chance to be in any of these uh, model UN because I was going to explain to you why this is different from a model United Nations. So I don't need to do that because you have no experience of it before. So you are approaching a new kind of United Nations that we are recreating in this place. As Dr. George Kulangara said, the United Nations should not be only in New York, Nairobi, Vienna and Geneva. It has to move around. In fact, the Iranians wanted to shift it to Tehran, but many people did not enjoy that idea because they thought it would be rather difficult to maintain a United Nations in Tehran. But uh, certainly there is a demand for the UN to be spread all around the world. And uh, we will be, in a sense, helping that universality of the United Nations by recreating the UN here in this little village of Kerala. And uh, we need to work very hard for it because we must make a contribution to the UN thinking. That is the whole idea of this. Normally, model United Nations are for fun. We'll, of course, have a lot of fun. But what we are trying to do is not to take liberties with the UN procedures and systems. The model UN has been designed for students and there is a, there is a direction that is given by a central setup. And they follow a particular procedure which is slightly different from what we see in the UN. So the model UNs are normally more fun than the UN itself. If you think that we have so much fun in the UN, you are mistaken. So what we are trying to do is to recreate UN in its pristine purity as it takes place in New York and other headquarters of the United Nations. So you may find this is much more formal, much more substantive, and much more serious than model United Nations. Model United Nations, you have fun, you can raise any question, you can fight with each other. It is how it is, it is uh, normally designed. But here, at least as far as possible, we'll replicate the UN. All the same procedures, methodologies, everything. So the first thing that you have to learn is, from now on, you're all distinguished delegates. No other name, right? You are a distinguished delegate of India, you are a distinguished delegate of Pakistan, you are a distinguished delegate of United States. No Mr., Miss, Madam, Sir, nothing. Okay? And when you address another delegate, you just call him the distinguished delegate of Oman or whatever, right? So you lose your name in a sense. In fact, my 20 years in the UN, nobody knows my name. They always call me India. So that's what's going to be. Or each one of you will be turned into a diplomat of a particular country, which means you need to learn a lot about that particular country because you are going to represent that country at the UN replica next week. So we have assigned countries to most of you. We may have some readjustments. And therefore, after that is done, your job from now till next week is to learn as much as possible about the country assigned to you, okay? Its geography, its history, its position in the United Nations particularly. And what exactly that country's persona in the UN. In fact, I can tell you that unless you work in a multilateral environment like the United Nations, you do not understand the respective positions of various countries in the world. For example, we think India is the center of the world. We think India is what matters. But when you go into 193 countries, then you will know where we stand, how the world looks at you. And this is possible because each one reflects his best thinking. And therefore, everyone has to struggle in order to maintain the status and dignity of your country. 
And similarly here, this is what we expect you to do. There is enough material to read. So we will explain to you the items that we are discussing and you have to do a little bit of research, of course, with our, with our help, to see what exactly is the position of that country which you represent on these four issues we are going to discuss. I don't know whether you had a chance to look at the agenda, have you? Or no? Have you seen the pamphlet? You have seen? So what are the agenda items? We are doing two things. First, we are going to recreate the Security Council. And this I don't think has been done in India so far. At least I have not heard of anyone trying to replicate the UN Security Council. And the other one is the General Assembly. In the UN Security Council, as you know, there are only 15 members. So 15 of you will represent the existing 15 members of the Security Council. As you know, the Security Council has permanent members and non-permanent members. The five permanent members remain forever. The others are elected for two years each. And every year at the end of December, one set of non-permanent members retire. So what we have done is we have created the Security Council as it exists in November. Because every month the president of the Security Council changes by rotation, by alphabetical order. So as it happens, November will be chaired by the ambassador of Senegal. Senegal is a French-speaking country. So whoever is the representative of Senegal will be the president of the Security Council during November. And during this period, he is the spokesperson for the Security Council. He is the negotiator for the Security Council. He is the authority which can reflect the thinking of the Security Council. Right? So permanent members do not matter when it comes to the presidency of the, of the Security Council. They also get it by rotation, not otherwise. So then, after Senegal, all the countries which are serving in the UN at this time, those countries are selected. India is not a non-permanent member of Security Council now. Japan is there, but there are others, other countries, not very major countries, but they are all countries which, has been, which have been designated by the General Assembly to operate in the Security Council for two years. So those 15 we will select and let you know who they are. So that is the first session we will have. The Security Council normally what you see is only the formal aspect of the Security Council. If you look at a film or you look at a video, you will normally find that the Security Council is very sedate and very, very uh, sober and you know people just pr uh, make prepared speeches. But that's only one part of the Security Council functioning. The more interesting part is something that you will never see unless you are yourself on the Security Council. I had the privilege to be on the Security Council from 2011 to 2012. That is the time we served on it the previous occasion. That was a very interesting time. It was soon after the Gulf War, which was very, very interesting for the Security Council. So, and there, when the informal consultations, it is very interesting because you see how the power is used by each country. How the permanent members exert power on you, force you to do things, you make concessions, they make concessions. That's the most interesting part of the Security Council functioning. So you will, we will have a session first and the topic that we have discussed, we are going to discuss, has not been discussed in the Security Council before because it has not been referred to the Security Council before. And this is what is called the expansion of the Security Council, which is the most delicate negotiation taking place for the last 35 years. When I went to the UN first in 1979, that is the year in which the Indian delegation put forward a proposal for the expansion of the Security Council. Even today, no decision has been taken. Maybe you think that India will be a permanent member next day or two days later. That is the impression we have but it is not going to happen in a hurry. So I want to demonstrate that. What are the opinions of the various members of the Security Council with regard to the expansion of the Security Council? This has not been debated in the Security Council itself, so you cannot take Security Council speeches. But all these countries have they expressed their opinion on the subject in the General Assembly. So once the General Assembly passes a resolution with two-thirds majority, then only this 
question will go into the Security Council. So we are going to imagine that the General Assembly has already adopted a resolution with two-thirds majority that the Security Council should be expanded. And then we debate in the Security Council and each country we will, we will find out by doing research, we will find out what is Senegal's position, what is Japan's position and all those will be expressed in a formal meeting which will be a, maybe about half a day in the morning of the first day, right? And for that you need to know, each member of the Security Council should know what exactly that country's position is on this particular issue. So you debate it, you make a formal statement, then you know that other countries who are not member states of the Security Council can also make representation to the Security Council by application. They can say we would like to participate in this and if the Security Council invites you, you will be allowed to participate in the discussion. So to create that drama, what we will do is, we will have the 15 members of the Security Council plus India and one other country which opposes expansion. India is in favor of expanding the Security Council, but there are about 40 countries which are called Coffee Club in the United Nations because they have no other name. They are called the Coffee Club because they drink coffee together and decide how to oppose expansion of the Security Council. Of course, Pakistan is a leading member, but we will not put up Pakistan, we will put up Italy, for example, because Italy is a, is a champion of no expansion of the Security Council. So these two will make presentations and then the formal Security Council will adjourn. And then we will create the informal atmosphere where no records are kept. You can say whatever you want to anybody you like. Of course, records are kept secretly, but those records are never published. And that is where you see arm twisting taking place. <coughs> People threatening each other. Most of, the, most of the time the threat is that we will veto you. So that is the final answer that you get. So you try to negotiate to make sure that the veto does not take place. And then after about an hour and a half or so, we would have come to an agreement as to what to do with this resolution. And in practical terms, the only thing that can happen to that resolution is that it will be vetoed. There is no question about it. Out of the five permanent members, at least two will veto it. That is China and the United States. France, Russia and um, UK. Maybe, maybe they will abstain depending on the language that you use in the resolution. So, and that is the first days. So first day, only the 17 people are involved apart from the Secretary General and the Under Secretary General for the, for the Security Council. And uh, we will have a thorough discussion. In the evening, there will be a resolution which will most probably be, be vetoed by United States and China, and there ends that. The second aspect of the replica is the General Assembly. General Assembly, as you know, is the highest body of the United Nations. Why is it the highest? Because that is the only body where every member is represented. Security Council is more powerful, but still it reports to the General Assembly. Finally, Security Council decisions have to go through the General Assembly. Of course, General Assembly doesn't vote on it. But the supreme authority of the United Nations is the General Assembly. And all the 193 members are represented. So we are not going to do that. We'll probably have about 100. All the 193 are not necessary to have to get, the, get a feeling of what happens in the General Assembly. So here we have selected three subjects. One which is of great concern to India is terrorism. There is a proposal for an international convention against terrorism which we put forward to the United Nations in 1992. Even today there is no decision. The Prime Minister keeps complaining that how come the United Nations does not have even a definition on terrorism. So that's a very good subject to be debated in the General Assembly. Of course there will be a clash between India and Pakistan so we need a good Indian delegate and a very good Pakistani delegate to fight that battle in public in the General Assembly. So that will be the hottest subject that will be discussed, terrorism, international terrorism. And the second is going to be the sustainable goals that we, that we just heard. But sustainable goals in the UN are discussed at the political level, not at the microbe level that uh, 
that you are advised about. Because you will be surprised to know, maybe he will be surprised to know, that we oppose the word sustainable in the UN for several years. India was in the forefront to say no sustainable. You know why? Because when you add sustainable to development, then development gets diluted. Do you understand that? The Western countries produce this word sustainable in order to regulate the development of the developing countries. In a sense, the development assistance given to the developing countries, the accusation often made is that it is not being used in a sustainable manner. So in other words, the word sustainable was introduced by the Western countries to regulate your development. They said, unless you do A, B, C, D, whether it is environmental considerations, whether it is human rights considerations, whatever, they were trying to colonize you again. So it is part of the neo-colonialism that the word sustainable was introduced. And we fought it tooth and nail for several years. But finally we had to accept it. And now the word sustainable has assumed a different meaning. That is something which is possible to sustain or possible to perpetuate because your resources are limited, your uh, capabilities are limited, and how do you use your capabilities and resources so that future generations are not deprived of it? And that is why the Conference on Development, Conference on Environment became Conference of Environment and Development. So there is a big divide in the United Nations between those who think that environment is more important than development and those who think that development is more important than environment. And the word sustainable came out of a compromise between the two.